Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. I want to thank the SOF for inviting me to speak and all of the members who have made this conference so um, terrific so far, especially Don and Bob and Tom Wisdom and Dorothea. So the whole conference committee, thank you very much. So again, um, I want to thank Michael Delahoyt for his assistance in the um, presentation. He's, he sends his regrets that he's not able to be here in person, but he did help me gathering source material and finding some music to share with you, just little snippets of music. And you will hear from him later today when he talks about Much Ado About Nothing. Um, and I also want to express my gratitude to the many scholars whose work I've relied upon to do this overview of Oxford and music. So we know that Oxford was a lyric poet, a playwright, a patron of writers, and a patron of composers. But did he also write music? That's the question that I'd like to talk about today. Um, looking at his education, his travels, his servants and colleagues to understand his ability and legacy. And you know, in addition to the extant lyric poetry, looking at some of the songs in the plays and the musical properties of the sonnets as clues to his talent as a writer and musician. Uh, Michael Delahoy's work on Edward de Vere's Madrigals is important, and we'll talk about that. Alexander Waugh's research into the music inherent in the poems, and Sally Mosher's exploration of Oxford's relationship with William Byrd will provide a foundation. And then we'll also look at evidence um, about music and lyrics written by Oxford um, and his contemporaries in the works of Stephen May, uh, Roger Stritmatter and Catherine Egar, among others. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about is whether or not um, we can find in Oxford's work, not just someone who reinvented theater, which is the subject of my new project, but also by default, the inventor of the modern musical. So we'll end there. So starting with the Oxford's poetry, much of which has been set to music, um, Thanks to the extensive work of Stephen May, J. Thomas Looney, and most recently, Roger Strittmatter, most of us are already familiar with the significance of Oxford's early poems. These authors have provided ample evidence that Oxford's extant poetry was, in fact, written with an expert understanding of music and song. Oxford's poetry was the key to my discovery of Shakespeare as of Oxford as Shakespeare when I read Shakespeare Identified and looked at Looney's process of identifying first, you know, Oxford, the, the fact that Shakespeare had to be a lyric poet, De Vere was a lyric poet, he analyzes the early poems of Oxford, then looks at the early poems of, and plays of Shakespeare, discovers parallels in form and content, and then looks at the sonnets, specifically the themes and structure of the sonnets as it relates to the themes in the early poems and plays, and concludes that the evidence adds up to Oxford as Shakespeare. So I had written some poetry and studied poetry as an undergraduate. I had done an independent study about androgyny in the works, Shakespeare's works, as an undergrad. And once I read Looney, I was convinced that Oxford was Shakespeare. Um, Strip Matter and Wildenthal open the introduction to the first volume of the poems of Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, by referencing Alexander Grossart's description of Oxford as a poet possessed of touches of the singer. Included in the second volume are songs from the plays of John Lilly, as well as poems published anonymously under pseudonyms or attributed to other writers. The authors note that the works included in the entire two volume collection exhibit a range of common strategies and motifs, including their rhythmic and lyrical fluency and testing the limits of lyric and narrative form. We know that Oxford poetry was considered innovative by his contemporaries. And even while some Stratfordian academics still choose to dismiss it as mere juvenilia, here Strittmatter and Wildenthal call our attention to the fact that above all, the experimentation tends toward the musical dramatic, setting the stage for the later, more sophisticated works of Shakespeare. The first eight poems that were published in 1576's Paradise of Dainty Devices are followed by the initials EO, and some scholars surmise that these poems may have been written uh, prior to 1566 when Richard Edwards, the volume's purported editor, died. The connection to Edwards is significant as it relates to Oxford's development as a dramatist and theater producer, which we will look at later when we talk about Catherine Egar's work. 
uh, Roger Strickmiller calls our attention to the importance of one poem, My Mind to Me, A Kingdom Is. He explains that for over a century and a half, it was wrongly attributed to Edward Dyer and only identified as Oxford's by Stephen Bay <clears throat> in 1975. Roger explains that the popular verse first achieved anonymous publication in William Byrd's 1588 collection, Songs and Sonnets. That this important poem first appeared in a collection by Byrd highlights the close relationship between the poet and the renowned composer. Oxford was a generous patron of an extended circle of playwrights and poets in the late 16th century. And Alexander Waugh, in documenting this crucial period in Oxford's career, has rightly dubbed him Phoebus Apollo, based on several contemporary references to the 17th Earl as such. Apollo was the god of music and poetry. So it is not surprising to learn that Oxford supported both writers and composers during his lifetime. To learn more about Oxford's relationship with these Elizabethan composers, I looked next at the research presented by Sally Mosher in her 2011 article for the SOF newsletter. She explained that William Byrd and the 17th Earl of Oxford were both at the court of Elizabeth from 1572 on. Both were involved in activities that provided music for the court, and during this period, Oxford saved Byrd from possible bankruptcy by selling a certain property to Byrd's brother. She suggests that Oxford and Byrd worked together for more than a decade and notes that Byrd is considered the greatest composer of, of the English Renaissance, as well as being an accomplished keyboard player and singer. Mosher claims that Oxford was known for his musicianship. He was also a ranking Earl who would have had his own tucket or musical signature to signal his arrival at tournaments and while traveling. The tune that lies at the heart of the Earl of Oxford's march has all the earmarks of such a tucket. Mosher further states that many of Shakespeare's plays contain the use of tuckets and suggests that we might date the composition to coincide with Oxford's military ambitions, acknowledging that we do not know if the patron commissioned the work or if the composer wrote it to honor his patron. She also tells us that a book of songs published by Anthony Munday um, in 1588, titled A Banquet of Dainty Conceits, includes lyrics to accompany the Earl of Oxenford's march. We know that Monday was one of Oxford's secretaries, so might we infer that the Earl wrote his own verses for the march, or mask as it was alternately titled? Did Oxford work with Byrd as a director, like Spielberg might work with his composer John Williams? Another composer whose praise for Oxford lends credibility to the argument that the poet and playwright was also a gifted musician was John Farmer, who wrote that using this science, music, as a recreation, your lordship has overgone most of them that make it a profession. To Mosher, this implies that Oxford himself may have written his own tucket, with Byrd later devising an elaborate march around it. Mosher examines in detail Byrd's The Battle Suite, in which the first song is identical to the Earl of Oxford's March, but has been given the new title, The March Before the Battle, in my Lady Neville's book, 1591. She argues that Byrd may have omitted Oxford's name because of bad blood between the two families, or as a result of Oxford's fall from favor in the 1590s. Mosher makes the analogy to music composed for silent films. The songs in this suite seem intended as accompaniment for some sort of theatrical piece portraying military action, she suggests. So let's just take a listen to a little bit of this.
Okay, I'm going to stop there as you get the sense of the military dramatic, right? Um, and for the sake of time, we'll continue on, but I'm uh, happy to share these recordings. As I said, I'm grateful to Michael Delahoy for helping me find them. Um, Moshe then explains that the only extant arrangements for the Earl of Oxenford's uh, Earl of Oxford's March, with one exception, are actually meant to be played on the virginal, an instrument that was not used in theatrical productions. So if we listen to the alternate version, you get a very different sense. This is the one titled My Lord of Oxenford's Map. Okay, so talking a, a little bit more about the virginal, um, Queen Elizabeth was said to be an accomplished player, although obviously in private, she never performed for the public on the virginal. And we were recently at the Victoria and Albert Museum where you can see a virginal made in Venice that is purported to be her own. And it is at the museum accompanied by recordings from several contemporary composers, including two of birds. You can listen to the music uh, while looking at the uh, instrument. Um, in her conclusion, Mosher mentions that Bird also composed the music for Oxford's poem, If Women Could Be Fair, which is included in a 1588 collection of the composer's vocal works. And Mosher expresses optimism that we may yet uncover more manuscripts that reveal the collaboration between Oxford and Bird. Uh, from the University of Cambridge, uh, Fitzwilliam Museum, we learn that the Fitzwilliams virginal book is widely regarded as the most important surviving manuscript of 16th and 17th century English music. It contains nearly 300 works. It is the largest. Uh, the tra transcriber of all this music is popularly believed to have been a Cornishman called Francis Tragian, who is said to have completed the book while in prison, in Fleet Prison, London, for being a recusant. He died in 1619, still a prisoner. However, this romantic account of the manuscript's origin um, has recently been called into doubt. The Trajan family might in fact have had nothing to do with the production of the book. And it's been suggested instead that the manuscript was the product of a scriptorium, a scribe's workshop connected to the English court. Several hands seem to have worked on the transcriptions, but the same Swiss paper is used throughout. This is a very high quality and the type used in English royal documents of the time. So I thought that that was kind of interesting, the scriptorium idea. Uh, during my last visit to the British Library, um, I examined a book of songs in the Rare Books Archive that was written in a single neat Italian hand and included, if women could be fair, the last song in the book. Um, the largest contemporary manuscript collection of William Byrd's works was assembled by the Norfolk gentleman, Edward Paston, whose library included at least 50 sets of part books supplemented by around the same number of printed sets from both Britain and the continent. The manuscript set includes masses, motets, Italian madrigals, French chansons, consort songs and instrumental pieces, almost everything but keyboard and solo lute music. The bird holdings contain a large number of otherwise unknown pieces and early versions of works later published by the composer. Alexander Waugh has researched Oxford's lyric poetry as it might have been played on the lute. In his talk for the De Vere Society event, The Food of Love, originally broadcast in autumn 2021, he talks with lutenist Elizabeth, Elizabeth Pallet about the instrument and its place in the world of Elizabethan England, the complexity of writing counterpoint music, and the relationship between dances such as the Galliard and the Volta and the tempo at which a piece was played. Wall reminds us that Oxford was known to be an excellent dancer. He quotes John Southern's praise of Oxford's musical skill and tells us that although we have no record of the instruments Oxford played, it's quite likely that Oxford could play all of the most popular instruments, the lute, the virginal and the recorder. 
He notes that the plays and poems of Shakespeare just display intimate technical knowledge of the workings of each of these instruments. Musicians were employed by <clears throat> noble, noble households as servants. And Waugh explains that Oxford chose those who could play, sing, act, write poetry, or compose music. Oxford, again, known for his generosity, in addition to providing William Byrd with the least two and the proceeds from the Manor of Battelles in Essex, arranged for, also arranged for an annuity of 20 pounds for, from his land and property in Essex for the lutenist Robert Hales. Waugh also reminds us that Oxford returned from his trip to Italy with the young chor chorister, Horacio Cuoco, who we're all familiar with, whom he had heard sing at the Church of Santa Maria Formosa in Venice so that he might sing for the queen and the members of the court at Westminster. Oxford's interest in music seems quite clear, but Waugh gives us uh, additional information about his work here. He gives us another example of this. He reads the song penned by Oxford when he was 16 years old, titled In Commendation of Music, and points out that three of the lines, these same lines appear in Romeo and Juliet, Act 4, Scene 5. He explains that these lines precede a comic conversation between three musicians with names associated with musical instruments. It's interesting to note that the poem was incorrectly listed in the Paradise as having been written by Master Edwards, referring to Richard Edwards, the publisher, uh, the compiler, I, I guess we would say. Waugh explains that the poem was removed from all subsequent editions of Paradise and cites as evidence for the attribution to Oxford, not just the unique ring of his voice in the poem, but the existence of a manuscript copy ascribed Ball, a pseudonym used by Oxford on three other poems. Waugh provides detailed analysis of the biblical references in My Mind to Me, A Kingdom Is, and its reflection of the hermetic ideas found in Shakespeare's work. He also notes that the song is composed in accordance with the divine trinity, with layered thematic motifs of three notes each, which are repeated three times to form a set. He concludes his talk with an interpretation of a sonnet that praises the combination of music and poetry comparing it with his friendship with R.L., whom William Cubbell in Polymantea in 1595 revealed, revealed to be Southampton. The poem to his friend, Master R.L., in praise of music and poetry, is significant because it was first published in The Passionate Pilgrim as being by William Shakespeare, sometime around 1596-97, but then later included in a pamphlet titled Poems in Diverse Humors in 1598. Waugh suggests that Barnfield may have included it in the collection of his own poems to hint at the true author. In the De Vere newsletter number 18, the author cites several examples of documentary evidence of Oxford's musical proficiency and his relationships with composers. They reference the work of Ruth Lloyd Miller and Stephen May to provide an overview of what we can learn from these documents. They say the Earl of Oxford's musical accomplishments were praised by professional musicians, and obviously John Farmer, the, comp the composer, uh, said in his Diverse and Sundry Ways in Two Parts in One, a treatise on counterpoint published in 1591, that his reason for dedicating the book to Oxford was that he was rather emboldened for your lordship's affection to this noble science, meaning music, hoping for the one you might pardon the other and desirous to make known your incl inclinations this way. Regarding the poem, A Crown of Bays from the Paradise, Stephen May notes that the first stanza of this poem is the second half of its variable refrain. The full refrain occurs as stanzas three and five, and the poem ends with the first half of the refrain. May concludes that Oxford may have written the poem for music or the poem and music both. The first edition of Paradise of Dinky Devices, as we talked about earlier, was published in 1575. And so if the entire collection was compiled by Richard Edwards, uh, the lyrics in question were actually written before Oxford was 16 years of age, again, since Oxford died in 1566. Given this promising start and the fact that the Earl's interest and skill in music could still attract farmers' notice as late as 1599, the De Vere Society newsletter concludes, it seems reasonable to expect that Oxford wrote other music during his lifetime and that the instrumental pieces 
are to be found among the extant music of the Elizabethan period. Betty Sears, in her article, Shakespeare, Oxford, and Music, cited Cambridge University professor, Dr. Edward Naylor. In his 1896 book, Shakespeare and Music, he argues that we can analyze Shakespeare's knowledge of music through two lenses, the historical and the psychological, encompassing the emotional and spiritual aspects of the author's use of music in plays and poems. According to Sears, Mailer says that out of 37 plays by Shakespeare, there are no less than 32 that contain interesting references to music and have musical matters in the text itself. He also notes that there are over 300 musical stage directions that occur in 36 of the 37 plays. And he explains hundreds of musical quibbles in the plays and poems, which are otherwise meaningless phrases. After looking at the works of contemporary composers, William Byrd, John Dowland, and Thomas Morley, Sears suggests that Oxford may have written some of the works ascribed to them and that the differences in style are apparent. She explains all three of these composers use, use the diatonic or eight note scale, while Oxford's music tends to be modal due to his musical experience in Italy. In King Lear, there is another clue to the ancient shape notes and the gamut or hexachord, Sears explains. She analyzes in detail act one, scene two in King Lear, which references the devil's interval in a scene that echoes Oedipus, concluding that the author was not only well-trained in early Italian music, but was also familiar with Greek tragedy. Next, Sears looks at the evidence that the popular tune Green Sleeves, included in John Dowland's manuscript housed at the Folger Library, may have been composed by Oxford. She explains that the tune is derived from a Scottish jig combined with an English Morris dance that Oxford would have seen while serving in the lowlands. She notes that Naylor has identified a song in Twelfth Night that references green sleeves and that the song is also mentioned in Merry Wives of Windsor. Most surprisingly, Sears says, National Public Radio classical musical music commentator Dr. Carl Haas did a one hour program on the origins and variations of green sleeves and revealed that in early Italian opera, Turandot, 300 years earlier than Puccini's Turandot, included green sleeves as an aria. Sears asserts that the evidence proves that Oxford knew the science of musical competition. Uh, but she says that the fact that Farmer's statements verify Oxford's musicianship doesn't tell us all, because Oxford's musical experience in Italy put him in a different category. It changed his style and technique. We turn next to the work of Dr. Michael Delahoy, whose research focuses on Oxford's travels in Italy. Delahoy has traveled to Italy a number of times to search for documentary evidence of Oxford's encounters in Venice and elsewhere in 1575 and 76. He's also edited uh, an Oxfordian edition of Twelfth Night, a play that features lots of music and Italian source materials. Michael uh, concurs that the song Green Sleeves remains a mystery. It's been suggested again that Oxford might have been the composer of this very famous song. And because of that, it's very interesting to all of us as Oxfordians. Uh, he notes that although it was rumored to be connected with Anne Boleyn, the tradition that Henry VIII composed it is unlikely because the whole idea, the Italian structure and style had not been imported into England until after Henry's death. The song was registered in 1580. But ever the wit, Michael calls our attention to the irony of the recasting of this tune into the Christmas song, What Child Is This? Let's just hear a little bit of that. <laughs> Oh, my. 
already. I got like 10 minutes left. I apologize. <laughs> So Michael explains if Shakespeare merely rhapsodized uh, about the emotional and mystical effects of music as he does through Lorenzo and the Merchant of Venice or offered merely a scattered selection of puns as do Julia and Lucetta in Two Gentlemen of Verona, we might be impressed that a merchant class playwright in London had also picked up, aside from his acquired knowledge of countless other fields, some of the vocabulary and concepts of an art sufficiently connected to theater, not to be too surprising. But Shakespeare knows. He knows specialized technical matters in music, the gamut and taming of the shrew, the rhythm in prick song and the minimum rest in Romeo and Juliet and the stops and in instrumental finger fingering in Hamlet. Michael's website is an excellent resource for those wishing to learn more about the importance of the madrigal and understanding Oxford's knowledge of music. He tells us that five sets of Italian mad madrigals were printed in England between 1588 and 1598. And he shares on his website the dedication to the 1588 collection, Musical Transalpina, where the dedica dedicator says, I had the hap to find in the hands of some of my good friends certain Italian madrigals, translated most of them five years ago by a gentleman for his private delight, as not long before certain Neapolitans had been Englished by a very honorable personage and now a counselor of the state, whereof I have seen some but never possessed any. I asked the gentleman if I might publish them, but he always refused, saying that those trifles, being an idle man's exercise of an idle subject written only for private recreation, would blush to be seen otherwise than by twilight, much more to be brought into the common view of all men. Nicholas Young's publication created great demand for English madrigals, which was met by Thomas Morley, a student of um, William Byrd, who subsequently published 11 collections of madrigals. Uh, Michael gives us an example of a typical um, light, even trivial type of madrigal with the song, um, Now is the Month of May. Comparison, he suggests, the work of another person of interest, maybe the musician of most interest, named Thomas Wilkes. Despite the general insistence that madrigalists did not set Shakespeare to music, Wilkes is credited with a piece titled Kiss Me Kate, and in a 1597 collection of his madrigals, includes as lyrics an uncredited poem, number 17 from The Passionate Pil Pilgrim, about which Catherine Children tells us. Some say there was no reason to doubt there was a Shakespearean authorship. The most lavish praise for Wilkes centers on the most astonishing of madrigals, Thule, the period of, of cosmography. And he notes that the final phrases concerning freezing and frying also echo a bit of the taming of the shrew. Delacroix asks, could Wilkes be another Oxford pseudonym? So let's just listen to this one. Okay, so if you compare this to now is the month of May and you'll see the complexity versus that quite simple one. But Michael on his website acknowledges the work of many other scholars in this area, particularly doctors Eric Altshuler and William Jansen and Catherine Agar. And I was 
excited to find Egar's work. Um, in 1935, she presented her uh, research at a meeting of the Royal Music Association. And as I said, because it kind of fills in some gaps in terms of Oxford's develop as, development as a theater producer, uh, I was really interested to hear how well her received her remarks were. Uh, she was inspired by the publication of Looney's book, Shakespeare Identified. And when she introduces her subject to her audience, she uses the quote from Percival Golding. He was a man in kind and body, absolutely accomplished with honorable endowments, which is from the manuscript that Bonner and I uh, translated from the British Library. Egar looks at Oxford's involvement with the court revels. She notes his father's influence as one of the few noblemen at the time who had his own troop of players. And she speculates that after coming to London in 1562, it's likely that De, De Vere attended Westminster Scholar's Latin play with Her Majesty. And then in 1563, Westcott's Children's of St. Paul performance up for the Christmas revels at court would have also been attended by Oxford. So she makes the case for his continued exposure to theatrical productions once he came to London. Then she introduces us to, again, Richard Edwards, master of the Chapel Royal. <clears throat> the obvious choice, she says, to serve as Oxford's instructor in both singing and counterpoint, the intertwining of two or more melodic lines of music. Agar notes the need for new materials for the boys' companies to provide the Queen's entertainment. She noted that they needed something shorter than the Roman comedies and sim simple English rhymes to help with memory, something pretty and pathetic to please the ladies, the songs merry, to show the power of music and give the children a chance to show off their voices. Here she supposed it was, a, was an opportunity for Oxford to work with Edwards on developing new plays. This is an important theory, as I said, about Oxford's development as a playwright and theater director producer. Eggers describes the entertainments at Cambridge University during the Queen's Progress in 1564, including a performance of Dido, which Oxford would have seen, <clears throat> the elaborate productions at Cambridge University, and the impression they would have made on the 14-year-old Oxford is one of the subjects of my new project with which I recently talked uh, to Dorna in, at Cambridge. Um, and then in Christmas 1565, Edward's Children of the Chapel acted a classically inspired play based on the story of Damon and Pythias, and this Egar attributes to Oxford. She concedes that the play is extant and has always been ascribed to Richard Edwards, the master of the chapel. But she argues that while Edwards wrote the music for the play, of which one song, Awake You Woeful Whites, survives, the actual play, which is entered in the Rebels' accounts as Edwards' tragedy, was by Edward, Edward de Vere, who was indeed as one title page put it, sometimes of Her Majesty's Chapel. The alliterative rhyming lines in the play clearly echo the extant poetry of the Earl of Oxford. The play presented at Christchurch during the Queen's visit to Oxford next summer, 1565, was Palamon and Arcy. And Egar notes a reference to the Queen's calling for Mr. Edwards, the author. But Egar's concludes, I for one am inclined once more to assign the music to the master, Richard, in the play to the Lord Edward. She explains that Elizabeth had thwarted Oxford's desire for military service abroad by putting him in charge of the rebels and that the Christmas rebels presented each year, the year of his appointment, which coincided with his wedding celebrations included five plays by four different companies, one of which appears to be a revival of Parliament and Arcite. Egars traces the appointment of Sussex as Lord Chamberlain, the establishment of his company of players and Leicester's men reconvening, which preceded Oxford's 1575 trip to Italy. And she notes that when he returned to London, there was an outburst of plays. She further speculates that Oxford was involved in the decision to lease space at Blackfriars for a singing school in 1576 and its subsequent use as a space for rehearsals. In 1583, Oxford took over the lease from Blackfriars and reconciled with the queen and Egar sees this moment as the catalyst for an unprecedented outburst of theatrical achievements. With the formulation of the Queen's men, including the best actors from the companies of Oxford, Sussex, Leicester, and Warwick, she explains that Oxford now had a top-rate troupe, his own school of music and acting for the juveniles and female parts, and highly important, he had his own private rehearsal theater. Now, we also know that the curtain was likely um, Oxford's space for rehearsal, but an as an example of the highly sophisticated productions resulting from these developments, she cites the arraignment of Paris with its extensive musical references. 
And she notes that the queen had the satisfaction of knowing that all these expenses fell not on her, but on the Lord Great Chamberlain. In other words, Oxford uh, bore the cost of these elaborate revels. Uh, she ends her uh, talk by saying that, you know, after 13 years of fulfilling the queen's wish to aim all his courses at the rebels, um, he complained and received the thousand pound annuity. Now, you know, we know there are several theories and most importantly put forward, I think, by Bonner Cutting um, about the annuity and its, its origin. But Egar ends by saying, basically, this started a new chapter in his career. And uh, this is where she ends her talk. A few people in the association had questions for her. Uh, one of the members asked her about the reliability of Farmer in, ter in terms of his two dedications, uh, because clearly they could be flattery or exaggerated praise, uh, to which she replied that she hopes the three-part counterpoint Oxford is supposed to have written will be discovered as further proof. Dr. Fellows added that it was impossible that a man of Oxford's culture should not have been a musician. Then she was challenged by Dr. Fellows to justify the assumption that because Oxford knew counterpoint, he must have been a composer. She explained, Lord Oxford did many things, both anonymously and pseudonymously. He was very mysterious. He would never put his name to a thing if he could avoid doing so. So lastly, I just want to talk about what we can learn from other playwrights whose work was heavily influenced by music. A great example is August Wilson. He left his suburban Pennsylvania high school at age 15, where he was subject to relentless racism, determined to educate himself at the local library, immersed himself in, in books ranging from the works of classical writers to leading Black American writers, and his cycle of 10 plays spanning 10 decades, music plays a prominent role. Uh, he said of, at the opening of Seven Guitars, I chose the blues as my aesthetic. I create worlds out of the ideas and attitudes and the material in the blues. I think the blues are the best literature that Blacks have. It is an expression of our people and our response to the world. I don't write about the blues. I'm not influenced by the blues. I am the blues. The authors uh, noted that the soft-spoken Wilson is also a lyric poet and consummate storyteller whose bluesy plays are propelled by language and that he uses the voices of his characters to convey time and place. And the playwright concurs. He said, I don't do any research other than listen to the blues. That tells me everything I need to know. And I go from there. He was influenced at an early age by the work of Bessie Smith and was said to have had an astonishing memory. So I think there's something to explore there. In conclusion, I agree with Mosher, Sears, Edgar, that we must continue the search for uh, extant manuscripts that show that Oxford was in fact a composer. And to answer the question of did Oxford invent the musical, I took a look at Ren Dreyer's 2000 article about Twelfth Night. There she says, Shakespeare's plays were like musicals and operas where the songs basically convey character, action, plot, and, and they specify a mood. And so uh, one of the song that is featured in um, Twelfth Night, Oh Mistress Mine, she notes is an admonition to Olivia to live in the moment, to be in the here and now, because we don't know what the, the future holds. And I think that's appropriate uh, for where we are here today in New Orleans, where the uh, motto is, laissez le bon temps roller. Let the good times roll. Thank you, everyone.